aspect of the regime. Here are some examples of recent attacks, and they, they illustrate our approach. First, we attacked the regime directly. This is a strike against an Iraqi intelligence service building in Karbala, and it was attacked two nights ago. This is a Ba'ath Party headquarters building in Al Hilla. This is a military headquarters building in western Iraq. And this is a communications building in western Iraq. These are all attacks against the regime directly. We attack forces defending the regime. This first image is a tank in a revetment north of Al Nazaria. The next image is an air defense radar in the western desert near H3 airfield. As the next video clips show, we also attack the logistics that make it possible for the Iraqi forces to be sustained and we prevent them from being sustained. The first image is a fuel truck in a revetment near Al Qut. The second one is an ammo truck near An Najaf. And the final one is an ammo storage area near Baghdad. Coalition Special Operations Forces continued their operations and actions throughout Iraq. They're facilitating attacks against regime targets and death squads within urban areas. These attacks are enabled by information provided by the local populations. Our special operations forces have also been effective interdicting movements into or out of Iraq and movements within Iraq by Iraqi commandos, missile units, or others. This is an example of an encounter that occurred along the highway west of our Ramadi. Coalition Special Operations Forces destroyed two convoys of vehicles, including 10 tanks. We've also used Special Operations gunships with great effectiveness against regime targets and also targets of opportunity, as this next video shows. This is H-2 airfield in the Western Desert. It had aircraft dispersed on it. Special Operations Forces observed it, called in AC-130 gunships, and destroyed the aircraft on the ground. Our land component developed the situation on the ground in several areas, seeking out concentrations of terrorist death squads and paramilitaries to further reduce their effect while also attacking divisions of the Republican Guard. UK forces fought near Basra to eliminate enemy positions and succeeded in capturing several hundred enemy prisoners and attacking some Iraqi gunboats nearby. First Marine Expeditionary Force conducted raids into Al Fajr south of Al Qut, which you see on the map. They were able to capture several Ba'ath Party members, several weapons caches, destroyed air defense equipment, and exploited a number of documents found nearby. Near Talil Airfield, southwest of Al Nazaria, the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force seized a large weapons cache, about 40 buildings worth, containing ammunition, 
chemical decontamination equipment, and that includes a Samara decontamination vehicle, chemical suits, and unidentified artillery munitions. Fifth Corps conducted attacks near An Najaf, near positions east of the river, and captured three small weapons caches. Additionally, Fifth Corps concentrated air attacks and artillery fires against the Medina Division's tanks, artillery systems, and command posts. We continue to see brutal acts by the regime and the forces loyal to it. An example came from an outpost in front of 1st Marine Expeditionary Fo Force a day ago. The story goes like this. Uh, during daylight hours, two vehicles rapidly approached the Marine checkpoint at a high rate of speed. When they failed to stop, having been signaled by a psychological operations loudspeaker team present at the site, they were taken under fire by the checkpoint. The lead vehicle, a sedan, immediately halted, and the second vehicle, a truck, rear-ended it. An adult male, an adult female, and two children exited the sedan. Two Iraqi soldiers exited the truck with weapons, and one of the soldiers shot and killed the adult female. After a brief firefight, both Iraqi soldiers and the three surviving civilians lay wounded. As the Marines approached, one of the wounded soldiers pulled out a weapon and was killed on the spot. The Marines evacuated the remaining wounded and upon searching the truck found 120 millimeter mortars and mortar ammunition. The land component continues its efforts to destroy any forces that are encountered and also any forces that would threaten the supply lines. Our maritime component continued its work of keeping open the waterways and did find some mines in the shallow waters of Corabdella. As we continued expanding the channel way, all those mines have been destroyed. Also, in an effort to increase the security of the ports, the maritime component is searching any vessels that remain to ensure that there are no threat. And this short video shows a boarding party doing that work. This is a search aboard the deck, and then you'll see them attend, uh, uh, ascend to clear the, rest, the remains of the boat. Dangerous work, but important work, and it's necessary to ensure that anything that's in the ports is safe. The coalition continues to push information to the Iraqi population, and at this point we've now pushed our ground-based communications capability further forward by moving a ground base into Iraq. Up to this point in time, it was in neighboring countries. Our coalition forces also continue efforts to preserve Iraq's future resources, and that remains a very, very good news story. And I have a few things to highlight from our actions in that regard. First, the oil well fighters we've talked about for the last several days were successful in extinguishing one of the three fires burning in the Ramallah oil field. The video that I'm about to show you is the, the moment of truth and mission accomplishment as you see the fire extinguished and then the well being kept. With that, that one's over. Our efforts continue to extinguish the last two fires in the Romila oil field, and we are confident that we'll be successful on that here in the coming days. Additional good news, fresh, clean water began flowing through the pipeline from Kuwait to Umkazar yesterday. The pipeline construction project makes it possible now for over 625,000 gallons of clean drinking water to flow daily. The coalition escorted aid convoys to Umkazar, Azubair, and Safwan. And a local school and market are due to reopen today in Ramila after a period of closure. Finally, our civil affairs teams are continuing their assessments amongst the population in the south. These teams provide useful information, training, and assistance to the Iraqi people. And they also help to assess the most vital needs of the population. And of course, they act as the initial goodwill ambassadors for, on behalf of the coalition.
leader of Iraqi forces in the south, that is General Ali Hassan al-Majid, known to some in the U.S. military and especially in northern Iraq as Chemical Ali. We've received new video of what appears to show Iraqi fighters in civilian clothing surrendering to British forces near Basra. These are some of the pictures coming in from the British pool just a short time ago. Also near Basra, tanks rolled over a sign depicting Iraqi President Saddam Hussein. There are many of them ahead in Iraq. Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard. Jeff Thompson, ABC News, Central Iraq. A week ago, this section of the city of Nazaria was the site of one of the fiercest battles the Marines have fought in this war yet. And now the same Marines, those who came under fire from Iraqi forces, are now patrolling the street of Nazaria to try to establish a contact with the civilian population here in Nazaria. The idea is to meet some doctors, some lawyers, uh, some teachers, people who could try to restore some kind of life in the city of Nazaria. Those civilians who come into contact with U.S. Marines appear to be generally welcoming the presence of U.S. forces here. And one of the civilians with whom we had a chance to talk told us that he was happy that the Marines were here and they understood they were trying to help the, the population here. But he also told us that there were still some pockets of resistance in town, the Saddam Sudain, and he himself was afraid to mention the name of Saddam Hussein. Yes, if, uh, uh, if I, 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 I said anything from bad from my boss, who is your boss? I can't. Yes. Kill me. Militia. While patrolling the streets of Nazaria, the Marines came across one man who had a letter for the President of the United States, George W. Bush. He wanted to meet him. Another man said, please help us out because we need some water. The U.S. Marines promised that in the coming days, water at least will be restored in town. I'm Alessio Vinci, CNN, with the U.S. Marines in Nazaria. A game of skill and chance. <laughs> the point of Dama is to isolate your opponent. The men in Harir have lots of time to play these days as they wait for the battle further south to play out. The war is going slowly, says Pirbal Rahman Hassan. We didn't expect it to be like this. We thought it might be finished in two or three days. People throughout this region thought America's overwhelming military power would mean a quick and easy victory. Apart from special forces, U.S. troops have only been in the north a few days. They've begun fanning out on patrol after parachuting into the Harir airfield just a few miles from here. They travel light, but one of the things each paratrooper dropped in with was a translation card with key phrases in phonetic Kurdish. There's a phrase there that says, my government will repay you for your assistance. What does that mean? Well, I think what that means is if you'll help me, I'll try and help you uh, in return. The Kurds are more than eager to help the U.S. to try to topple Saddam Hussein. Peshmerga Kurdish guerrillas are providing support for American soldiers. But as friendly as this territory is, it's just a few dozen miles from the Iraqi front lines. There deliberately isn't much contact between Kurdish civilians and the American soldiers. Abdullah Aziz Abdullah's house overlooks the airfield. He sees the soldiers only from a distance. The Peshmerga forbids us to talk to them, he says. He says that's because they fear Iraqi intelligence agents posing as Kurdish civilians could attack them. In town, most people catch only glimpses of the soldiers. This is the main street of Harir. The American soldiers are just down the road. So far, people here haven't seen a whole lot of them, but they say just knowing they're there makes them feel safer. <laughs> Salar came to Harir from the major city of Erbil because he feared it could be a target for Iraqi attacks. He sells socks on the street here for 15 cents a pair. I haven't seen the soldiers, he says. I only see the planes, and when I see a plane, I'm a little reassured. It makes me feel a little better because Saddam can't do anything to the Kurds. It's not the tens of thousands of ground troops most Kurds were longing to see, but to people here, this scaled-down American presence, even at a distance, is reassuring. Jane Araf in Harir, northern Iraq. At first, smoke rose over the capital of Iraq on Monday after several explosions rattled the capital. An earlier air raid 
uh, coalition forces targeting a presidential palace that was near Saddam International Airport on the west side of the, of the city, as well as an intelligence complex. Republican Guard units south of the city also being hit. Iraqi front line about 40 kilometers, 25 miles from Mosul, one of the major targets. Now, Kurdish officials have been saying that there has been heavy damage and extensive military losses inflicted in bombing all along the front line. And indeed, we're seeing some of the front lines shifting. Now, Kurdish officials describe that as a tactical retreat. There we go. Another bomb hitting on that ridge just across the front line that's believed to be Iraqi bunkers up there. It has prompted, prompted earlier today some desertions from the Iraqi army, those who managed to escape. This could go on for some time, Jim. What we've been seeing is once it starts, there are irregular bombings. The explosion's loud enough to rattle the windows here. It's believed to be softening up that front line, and it's continuing now. This, this is the toll for the past day and few hours. We destroyed 13 tanks and eight personal carriers. And six armored vehicles. We shot down four Apache helicopters. And we shot down two Predator planes, unmanned planes. And a command vehicle. We killed 43 U.S. and British soldiers. That's 43 U.S. and British soldiers. We captured significant quantities of military equipment.